Joining us now is Ojini Kaupe with stories trending around the world. Hello, Oji. Good morning, Dr. Abati. Thank God it's Friday. Thank God it's Friday. You have successfully used my full name this entire week. Well done. <laughs> <laughs> well, TGIF. Good morning, Rafai. Morning, it's nice to you? have you in here. Nice How to are see you? Yeah, very well. Great. Good, good, good. I love your pink tie. Thank you. Great. Gracias, gracias. Obrigado. <laughs> <laughs> He's Italian now. <laughs> well, good morning to you, viewers. Here are some of the stories that are trending across the globe. In the United Kingdom, journalist Martin Bashir, who interviewed the late Princess Diana in 1995, made headlines on Thursday after a report by the British Broadcasting Corporation revealed that he used deceit to win the sensational interview in which Princess Diana disclosed intimate details of her failed marriage to Prince Charles. We had struggled to keep it going, but obviously we'd, all, we'd both run out of steam. Prince William and his brother, Prince Harry, on Thursday issued strongly worded statements criticizing the BBC and the British media for unethical practices. BBC employees lied and used fake documents to obtain the interview with my mother. And a photo of the Duke of Cambridge taking his first jab of the COVID-19 vaccine tops the trend. In Russia, Twitter was a buzz after President Vladimir Putin vowed to knock out the teeth of any power who tries to take a chunk of the country's territory. And a 1927 aquarelle painting by Russian artist Vasily Kandinsky that had been missing for 70 years is up for auction for an estimated 300,000 euros in June. In Mexico, 72-year-old Andres Mendoza, a serial killer who confessed to have eaten the body parts of his victims, was arrested after remains of his 34-year-old missing girlfriend, and at least eight other dismembered women were discovered at his home. In Spain, a video of a migrant boy who desperately used plastic bottles to stay afloat while attempting to reach the Spanish enclave of Cita has made the rounds. Under sports, American sprinter Lee Evans, the first man to crack 44 seconds in the 400-meter race, winning the gold medal at the Mexico City Olympic Games in 1968, has died at age 74 after suffering a stroke in Nigeria, where he was the assistant track coach at Odegbami International College and Sports Academy for many years. And seven medical professionals have been charged with simple homicide with eventual intent in the death of football legend Diego Maradona. Finally, under entertainment, respect, the official trailer for the biopic of soul singer Aretha Franklin starring Academy Award winner Jennifer Hudson has been released. The biopic is set to hit the cinemas on August 13th. She's a miracle. Well, let's begin what's trending in Nigeria. An investigative report revealed that 30 million Naira contract, allegedly awarded by the Federal Ministry of Agriculture and Rural Development, to build a Friday mosque, as seen in a memo that has now gone viral on social media, is non-existent. According to the memo, the project was approved on December 10, 2020, and was signed by the Deputy Director of Procurement in the Ministry, Juan Musa Musa. The investigative report indicated that there was no information on the construction of the Friday mosque in the Ministry's 2020 budget, despite the eight weeks timeline, as indicated in the contract. The report also indicated that the contractor mentioned in the memo has an inactive status at the Corporate Affairs Commission. While many Nigerians expressed outrage on the leaked memo, including former Senator Dini Malaye, who wrote, What? Despite all the challenges facing food security, building a mosque is the Federal Ministry of Agriculture's priority. To pray for rain or what? How did we get here? For heaven's sake. What has the government got to do with churches? or a mask? Rufai, that's the question for you. I mean, Oji, for me, this is another sad reminder of how terrible things have got in this country. Uh, this was not even about the mask. It was just a way to siphon money. 
and when you look at it critically, plants orchestrated, maybe it carried more weight because they lied that a religious house was going to be built. But the deeper part I would like to see, look at is the fact that we keep siphoning money. In a ministry that has not done a lot for farmers in this country, put 30 million to build a mosque, Nigeria has one of the lowest tractor per hectare capital in Africa. For every one hectare of land, less than three or four tractors work there. In places like Kenya, it is 27. Nigeria has problem as regards agricultural irrigation. You ever wondered why we don't have all year round fruits in this country? It's because most farmers depend on the rain. In the 21st century where Israel has perfected irrigation, you have Israeli orange all year round. Because modern technology has been put into agriculture, we don't have all of that. And for only you to hear that the money in an agric ministry is not spent on improving variety of seedling, is not spent on improving hectare or yield per hectare, it is spent on building a mosque or allegedly spent on building a mosque. And you ask questions. Now, what is really happening? Who did this to us as a country? Dr. Abati, what's your well, take on the memo that? Is this. One memo. The memo is this. It okay. is official. Okay. Hmm. And the Ministry of Agriculture and Rural Development has issued a statement to confirm that it is their document and that they do not feel embarrassed anyway that they stand by what they have done, and that uh, you know the document and the various processes are available for public scrutiny. In fact, the award of this uh, 30 million uh, Naira contract for the building of a mosque, we were told even went through the tenders board. So they insist that it went through uh, you know, due process. What is the key explanation of the Ministry of Agriculture and Rural Development, that's the Federal Ministry, FMARD, it is that this mosque, they had to build it uh, in a place called, uh, is it Bamaluku government in, uh, in uh, Borono State for persons who have been displaced and who were resettled as a result of Boko Haram activities. And at that community, you know, the resettled community specifically requested, you know, that the Ministry of, uh, Federal Ministry of Agriculture and Rural Development should build them a mosque. You know, in addition to other things that they claim uh, that they've done in that particular community, providing water, providing drainage, you know, a whole range of activities to reset to those people, those displaced persons in that community. Now, <clears throat> again, the point was made that this is not just Ministry of Agriculture, it is also agriculture and rural development, and in helping to reset to people uh, in their community, uh, you know, they, it includes their mandate. But I can understand why Nigerians are alarmed. I mean, uh, agriculture, the CBN, the Central Bank of uh, uh, Nigeria, has probably done more in the agricultural sector than the uh, current uh, Minister of Agriculture, Sanono, who is heavily heard from. And now that we've heard from his uh, ministry, it has to do with a mosque. Now, the outreach also has to do with Section 10 of the Nigerian Constitution. Section 10 of the Nigerian Constitution says the government of the Federation or of a state or any part of Nigeria, you know, shall not adopt any religion as state religion. So if government resources are now being used to build mosques, even if they are displaced persons, it is natural for the average Nigerian to say, no, you are violating Section 10 of the Constitution. You cannot use public funds to be building uh, 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 mosques. And there are people who are now asking, OK, you have built a mosque for people in uh, Borono State. Would the Ministry of Agriculture and uh, Rural Development also come and build uh, a church in our village? And uh, you know, don't be surprised if some uh, you know, traditionalists also say, well, the federal government of Nigeria should begin to build uh, shrines around the place. You know, because what is uh, good for the Ganda, what is yes. good, good for the good should also, also be good for the Ganda. Ganda. After all, these are all Nigerians covered by the same uh, uh, constitution. So tomorrow, if a shrine is washed off in, uh, you know, any part of Nigeria, maybe the Minister of Agriculture and Rural Development will also get involved. So this is, uh, you know, the picture of it. But I think we should stay with the principled position 
uh, that government departments, ministries, and agencies, uh, no matter the provocation, uh, should not get involved in using public resources to favor one religion or the other. If the whole thing is just restricted to oh, providing facilities for those displaced persons and all of that, building a mosque, I'm sure Sunono can afford it. You know, he probably should have built a mosque from his own pocket resources. Yeah, it's 30 million he could have, he could have organized, it's not a lot. You, know, uh, you know, interested parties Correct. from that part mm. of the country to say, oh, these people, they could have done a fundraising yeah. to provide a mosque. Correct. The problem is the use of public funds, you know, in violation of Section 10 of the Constitution. And maybe some Nigerians will go ahead and test it and approach, uh, you know, the Minister of uh, Agriculture and Rural Development to come and build uh, a church in their own village too because <laughs> they've been affected by flooding or by any kind of a, a natural uh, disaster. But we'd like to hear more from the Minister of Agriculture and yes, Rural I don't, Development I don't understand about, that, yeah, about what statement. they are doing for agriculture. Nothing. Ah, they are addressing the, the challenge of drought. We hear more about that from uh, Godwin Mefiele, you know, who seems to, uh, to have uh, filled that gap. But if there is a minister that is in charge of agriculture, we would like to hear more progressive ideas about him. Uh, from him, you know, he's not, uh, he's not been uh, put there by the president so that he can be going around building mosques and justifying that. All right. We'll take another story that has made the rounds on social media. Earlier this week, a man walked into a bank with his children to complain about what he described as illegal withdrawal from his bank account, he told the employees who gathered to quell his seemingly uncontrollable disposition that the illegal withdrawals have kept his children out of school. Before long, the man stripped himself down to his boxes to protest. Let's take a look. Don't touch me. Don't touch me. Don't touch me. I mean, this video has been circulating for more than three days now, mm. but I would like to have this conversation of the issue of illegal withdrawals from a bank account. I'm sure, you know, you've seen these um, transactions in your account every other day, and I know that it is quite infuriating. But, I mean, this man seemed like he had lost it at that point. He had lost it. Hear what he said there. My children can't go to school because yes. of this illegal withdrawal. You think he's happy stripping himself naked to make a protest? For him to do that, he had lost his dignity. They had stripped him of his dignity. Correct. So, the question should be, what are the security processes the banks are putting in place? There's a reporting line for this. Normally, it's through the CBN. You can make a call. I don't know the number readily of my head. You can make a call. You can send a letter across. You can get your lawyer to also to write. But the question is, what are the banks themselves doing as regards security of this? Because before somebody can withdraw any amount from your account, the bank should send a mail, a prompting to you, that are you aware of this transaction going? And if you are not aware, you should stop it. But if he says it's a repetitive... He said it's 300,000 Naira. That's what he said. Repetitive alleged. transaction. Yes. Then maybe some people have got wind of his card details. And the bank needs to come and help him tracking it down. Because you see, when bank provides a software application or a banking system or a system at which people could withdraw money, the bank must protect that system. So the bank must answer for it. It's not aliens that are withdrawing the money. There's a trail. There's somebody withdrawing the money. For every transaction, there's a withdrawal slip. There's a withdrawal letter going on. There's a withdrawal, what is it, evidence. So the bank should help him track that. And when somebody's uncontrollable, the bank should have pacified him to help him track that. He's showing his frustration like a lot of Nigerians are frustrated. Necessarily, yeah, you might say, why is he stripping himself a naked? A full-grown man, yes. But you don't know In front the, of his children, by But the you way. don't know the pain he's going yes. through. Do you think a man is happy to make a public mess of himself? No. So the bank should look into it, and the bank needs to answer quickly. At first, by tracking who is making the withdrawals, where is that money going to? And tracing it out. And that's why we, you should have a robust cybersecurity sector in the banking sector. Dr. Bati, your comment. Yeah. <clears throat> One, here we're dealing with customer relations and the failure of it. 
and uh, you know the uh, helplessness of the consumer within the Nigerian system. We had a federal, we have a federal competition and consumer protection uh, agency, which has been doing well <clears throat> under the man that is there. But uh, you know, the still the average consumer uh, in Nigeria is still very vulnerable. Now here is a bank customer. He has been protesting for a whole month. He had gone there repeatedly for a whole month. Nobody attended to him, or rather they did not address his concerns. And the man made a statement in Yoruba in that uh, uh, video. He said, look, I brought my money here mm -hmm. so that it will not be stolen, so that my money will be saved. So when did they start stealing money from the bank? Which is a very pertinent question, and he's not alone. He represents the plight of many Nigerians who have banking transactions yes. or who have to face challenges at the level of service delivery mm -hmm. or customer care. I don't want to mention the name of the bank. Some people, you know, they, from just looking at the colors, mm -hmm. they can tell you it's so-so-so-so so, so, so bank. But I think that particular bank already has enough trouble. They yeah. don't let us uh, <laughs> add, to add to the trouble. So I think that, you know, the banks, it should be a wake-up call for other banks too to make sure that that duty of care you, you follow through. After all, money that you put in the bank is insured. Yeah. It's covered by the NDIC, yeah. one way or the other. And then, of course, there's a lot of scam going on in the country. Even mm -hmm. when there is a, a scam, when it is a, uh, all these Yahoo Yahoo boys who withdraw money from people's accounts, where this person is not in a position to worry about the Yahoo Yahoo, the person that has the fiduciary duty is a bank the duty of care to make sure that his money is safe and that he gets interest on it and that whenever he needs his money, he gets it. So this, for me, are the key uh, issues in this regard. And the man to even uh, push home the point, when they are with the children, Correct. whose school fees he has not been able to pay, and 300,000 naira to a lot of people in this country, it's a lot of money. It's a lot of money. You may think it's uh, 300,000, it's a lot of money. It can yeah. perform magic for, for some families. So what do you mean by it? I think it's 300,000. <laughs> <laughs> then the other leg of it, of the analysis, is the man <laughs> stripping himself, uh, you know, uh, in the bank premises. Well, uh, that on the face of it is uh, it, it's a felony. Under Section 231 of uh, the Criminal Code, you are not allowed to perform indecent act. The Criminal Code does not talk about indecent exposure. It talks about indecent act when you behave in a way that can cause embarrassment to other people. This is a full grown man removing his trouser, removing his uh, shirt. At a point when uh, they were trying to restrain him, he removed his mustache. He did. I, he I did. just hope, I was he watching, did. I he hope uh, uh, the unthinkable will not happen. Like yeah. what, Dr. Batia? <laughs> 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 <Explain thing>. And <laughs> also, under Section 26 of the Violence Against Persons Prohibition Act, you know, uh, in this, that's the one that talks about indecent exposure. It's also a felony. And the punishment on both sides is about two years and an option of fine. But on that criminal law, the, the uh, problem, uh, the uh, indication is that this man is protected because he's acting out of provocation. Yeah. For the bank to lose somebody's money, some people have lost millions. But this 300,000 is like millions to the bank. Yeah. It is millions and to him, but it's just to the extent yeah. he will say there will be no banking here today. Yes, he says nobody would until work. Until I collect my money. Correct. But yeah. I would like to know uh, what the end of I'd it love is. To follow up Those on bankers, it. Yes. I mean, they could, uh, they could even uh, have you know, contributed 300,000 and uh, put bank in his account or help him to even pay his children's school fees. But banks must ensure that situations like this do not arise, mm. that things like this do not happen. And we hope that it will be a happy ending for him so that he will get his money back. Very well said, Dr. And the gentleman who was saying, don't touch him, don't touch him, I think he did well. Yes. Because it looked like the security be people were going to move in. But there was somebody restraining them, saying, look, don't touch him. And it, it was important that nobody molested him yes. for that. Very well said, Dr. Bati. We'll take our final story in the United Kingdom where Martin Bashir, who interviewed the late Princess Diana in 1995, made headlines on Thursday after a report by the British Broadcasting Corporation revealed that he used deceit to win the sensational interview in which Princess Diana disclosed intimate details of her failed marriage to Prince Charles. The BBC set up the investigation headed by former senior judge John Dason in November last year following allegations from Diana's brother, Charles Spencer, that he had been tricked into introducing Princess Diana to Martin Bashir, 
Prince William and his brother, Prince Harry, on Thursday issued strongly worded statements criticizing the BBC and the British media for unethical practices. I would like to thank Lord Dyson and his team for the report. It is welcome that the BBC accepts Lord Dyson's findings in full, which are extremely concerning. That BBC employees lied and used fake documents to obtain the interview with my mother, made lurid and false claims about the royal family, which played on her fears and fueled paranoia, displayed woeful incompetence when investigating complaints and concerns about the programme, and were evasive in their reporting to the media and covered up what they knew from their internal investigation. It is my view that the deceitful way the interview was obtained substantially influenced what my mother said. The interview was a major contribution to making my parents' relationship worse and has since hurt countless others. It brings indescribable sadness to know that the BBC's failures contributed significantly to her fear, paranoia and isolation that I remember from those final years with her. But what saddens me most is that if the BBC had properly investigated the complaints and concerns first raised in 1995, my mother would have known that she had been deceived. She was failed not just by a rogue reporter, but by leaders of the BBC who looked the other way rather than asking the tough questions. It is my firm view that this panorama programme holds no legitimacy and should never be aired again. It effectively established a false narrative which for over a quarter of a century has been commercialised by the BBC and others. This settled narrative now needs to be addressed by the BBC and anyone else who has written or intends to write about these events. In an era of fake news, public service broadcasting and a free press have never been more important. These failings, identified by investigative journalists, not only let my mother down and my family down, they let the public down too. Dr. Bhatti, we must give credit to the BBC for, you know, taking time to uncover this uh, report. I mean, it is quite heartbreaking to know that... It the BBC? This, yes, I mean, the, what do you mean? <laughs> I mean Dr. Bhatti, go ahead. The BBC are corporate, yeah. well, They are, but they, they did work to, to uncover okay. the investigative report that revealed that, you know, Batten Bashir lied to okay. get that interview. Well, the Lord Dyson report yes. is called into the uh, panorama interview, Correct. and it will be unveiled uh, formally this afternoon at 2 p.m. Uh, yes, the BBC has apologized mm -hmm. uh, because uh, they have admitted that this has fallen below uh, their, their standards. standards yeah. And uh, Martin Bashir, the journalist, he ended up before retiring due to health reasons as a religious reporter. Uh, he has said, well, uh, he apologizes, uh, he regrets uh, what he did. Uh, but the uh, family, you can see, so yes, uh, they're not talking about accepting their apology. They still feel very hot. Mm. And Earl Spencer, uh, the uh, uh, brother to uh, uh, Lady Diana, Princess Diana, mm. who introduced Martin Bashir to the sister when she was staying in a nice brief flat mm. uh, in London in 1995. He was at the meeting. He took notes. And apparently Martin Bashir lied uh, oh, to uh, the uh, princess, you know, telling him, uh, telling her all kinds of things about how her car was being bugged, about how the queen is a comfort eater, about how uh, Prince Edward was battling with uh, HIV AIDS, about how, you know, uh, uh, Camilla was depressed and was just keeping quiet in the meantime, all kinds of salacious details, mm. you know, which uh, Earl Spencer took notes of, and those notes are now in the public domain. This raises a question about trust. When you are interviewing somebody, Correct. it is assumed that you as a journalist will be professional. It raises an issue about professional ethics. Mm. You know, and Martin Bashir, as he himself has admitted, was unprofessional, was unethical. Mm. The fact that this contributed to uh, Princess Diana's uh, depression and to uh, the worsening mm. of her relationship with the royal family mm. is also a problem. So there's a lesson in all of this uh, for everyone. Uh, whether the apology mitigates it or not, uh, you know, I don't see how far that goes. What is required, what is being called for, is reform even within the BBC itself, yes. in terms of its governance system. Yeah. Yes, I like the fact that they did speak I, up. I mean, them. the truth has to be said, uh, the BBC bungled this. Mm. They're public service broadcaster in the first place. You expect the highest of ethical standards. But you know what the BBC became in that interview? Mm -hmm. They became like news of the world. They became like a daily tabloid run by Rupert Murdoch. That's what they became. 
for you to forge documents to tell a woman lies just to get information from her and run it on a show as prominent as Panorama. You see, when people watch the Panorama on the BBC, it's just like the BBC eye that they're doing in Africa. Right. That's what the Panorama is. They watch it because they know the BBC is telling them something new and they trust the British Broadcasting Corporation. But when the British Broadcasting Corporation could get a story in the Panorama by acting like a tabloid, I don't see anything different in what this BBC have done. What they have done is akin to what News of the World did with Millie Dowler. And this is reprehensible. The BBC must pay dearly for it because you can't bring back Diana. Well, they have come out to apologize. So, I mean, Apo I it gets to a point. Apology is, not, is enough. not enough. So, apology is not enough. Yeah, there is a reform. Thank you very much. Uh, Thank Virginia you, Dr. Abati. You guys have a great day.